All right, today we'll talk about purgatory. Purgatory is a doctrine of faith. It is a place of expiation either of venial sins, which have not been remitted before death, or for temporal punishment due to sin, which has not been satisfied before death. So those are the two things. We, uh, the venial sin not remitted or temporal punishment due to sin not satisfied. We often neglect number two. That is, temporal punishment due to sin not satisfied. Every time you commit a sin, you detract from the glory of God. You, you smash a window. You break something. You exist only for the glory of God. And therefore, there is a, a damage that is done, and that's known as temporal punishment due to sin. That damage must be repaired in one form or other. It is uh, easy to repair it. Uh, uh, authors say that the fervent receiving of Holy Communion eliminates all temporal punishment of the sin. Now that's certain the theological authors. It's you know, not the teaching of the Church, but uh, fervent prayer and fervent acts of charity toward God remit it. Also, certain sacrifices remit it. Indulgences remit it. Good works. That purgatory exists is attested to by sacred scripture and tradition and is taught as a dogma of the Catholic Church. When I was in Russia... We were visiting some ecclesiastical institution, and there was something about praying for the dead. And I said to the Russians that were with me, I, I said, I thought the Orthodox don't believe in purgatory. He said, well... <laughs> sort of a, you know, fluid. Why would you pray for the dead? Either they're in hell or in heaven. If they're in hell, you can't do anything about it. If they're in heaven, they're there. So why would you pray for the dead? Protestants do the same thing. They, they pray for the eternal rest of the dead person. It's either one or the other in the Protestant religion. Either you're saved or you're not saved. So there is a, even a natural understanding of purgatory, that there is a, a place in which to expiate sins after death. It's, a, it's common sense and nature that, uh, that attests to it. So Adam, for example, was forgiven, but he had to continue to pay the debt of his sin. So he had a hard life tilling the soil that would produce weeds. Moses, although pardoned of his fault, could not enter the promised land. His fault was that he struck the rock twice, thereby giving an indication of a lack of faith. And for that he was punished by not being permitted to enter the promised land. He looked at it from afar on a mountain. And that's where he made the prediction of Christ. And David, though pardoned, was punished by the death of his son that he begot with Bathsheba. Obviously, Solomon was not that son. Solomon was born thereafter, also by Bathsheba. But the, first, the one that was conceived in adultery was born still even though David had done penance. 
And our Lord speaks of the necessity to carry one's cross daily, to do penance and to fast. By analogy, it is not sufficient that a kidnapper merely restore the kidnapped child. So a kidnapper takes a child and I want you to give me a million dollars, otherwise I'm going to kill the child. And then he recants, he repents and brings back the child. Oh, here's your, here's your kid. He has to go to jail. It's a crime. There's a price to pay. Because the law demands a, a retribution when it is violated. Otherwise, there is not an order. There is not an order of justice. Not merely a you know, giving back the money you stole or giving back the child that you kidnapped. But there is something immaterial, and that is a disorder that has to be rectified. So there must be a compensating punishment. The will which has turned from God must also undergo a correction a punishment, which is the pain of sense. See, just as an iron bar could be bent, so it has to be bent back to may be made straight. Or if you dislocate your shoulder, it has to be put back in, which is an extremely painful thing if you don't have any sedation. I never had it happen, but I know it's extremely painful to have your shoulder be put back into place. That's the purpose of punishment, is to restore the order of justice. Purgatory also exists for unremitted venial sin and for the remains of sin, the reliquiae peccati, that is, an inclination toward a created good attachments to material things and created things. So you could confess and have good purpose of amendment, etc., but you still might have attachments, deliberate attachments to created things that are disordered. Disordered attachments. In other words, excessive attachments to created things. And be careful of those because that, those are the roots of venial sins. So in your confessions, you know, especially religious and seminarians, you're looking for those roots in you of sin. And that's why you should confess, through this vice I did this, through this vice I did that, through this vice I did this, through gluttony I ate too much. Through vanity, I did this. Through this, I did this. That's how you should confess. So you're confessing the roots of the sin, and you, you should be actually more sorry for the roots of the sin, the unmortified roots of the sin, than for the sin itself, because many of those sins are barely deliberate, or almost, you know, in other words, there's usually not a, a lot of deliberation in venial sins among people who are what you'd call of delicate conscience. In other words, people who are, are very conscious of the spiritual life and want to pursue perfection. See that, so most of your venial sins are due to the, the, the unmortified vices inside of you. Because you do them usually without deliberation. And that's the problem. There's so much a part of you that they come without deliberation. Impatience is a typical one. See, so examination of conscience is examination of those, the roots of those sins. 
And some of them come from character. There is something, you know, a character disposes us to certain sins more than to others. Cholerics obviously are disposed to anger. They get angry with everything. Phlegmatics are disposed to laziness. Disposed, that means it's easy for them to be lazy. Sanguines are disposed to lust and gluttony. Melancholics to pride, vanity. Disposition, that means it's easy. Vice is the habit. Just as some people have natural dispositions, natural gifts to play the piano. But a natural gift is not the same thing as the habit of piano playing. They have to learn. Other people have like 10 bananas for fingers and, and could not possibly play the piano if they you know, tried the whole day because they lack the disposition. which really just depends more on the, on the brain than on your hand. But you know that it was, uh, I think it was Paderewski who had his fingers cut here. I think one of those, so that he could have a bigger spread on the piano. So that's a little footnote for you. So the, uh, so, um, so these reliquiae peccati, these, these remains of sin, solicit the soul to fall back into the state of sin. The chief pain of purgatory is the delay of the beatific vision. As I said in the Deo Uno today, the, the human will is made to embrace the ultimate good. And in this life, we have a constant quest for good. And we fill in that desire for good by various temporary goods. And, of course, with the spiritual life, the ultimate good. But we have only a, an imperfect grasp uh, and possession of the ultimate good in the spiritual life. It is not the vision of God. It is not the, the permanent possession of God. And some have a possession of God that is greater than others. But... In the ordinary course of the day, we are pursuing limited created goods, reasonably and correctly. And these things keep us happy. But when, you, when all of those things are cut off after death, you are left with the you might say the abyss in your soul that can only be satisfied by God. And that's the pain of loss. You see a little bit the pain of loss when a loved one dies. That, that you know, when there's a big departure of some good. You, that's a little bit. But the soul is so deep with regard to its attachment to the ultimate good that you realize that depth when you die. And therefore, the, the loss, so the, just the fact that you are deprived of that good, even for a time, is the uh, pain of loss. Now, in hell, it's, it's, it's terrible because it's a permanent pain of loss. 
in purgatory, it's a temporary pain of loss. Although St. John of the Cross says that one of the pains of purgatory is that you are convinced that you're damned. So, that's what he says. But there is an immense difference between the pain of loss in hell and that of purgatory, which I mentioned. The damned souls hate God. They desire the damnation of everyone. They have no charity, neither love of God nor love of neighbor, nothing. They have no hope. They are all in despair and depression. If they could commit suicide, they would. And they're that depressed. So it's a whole world of depressed people. And they are obstinate in their attachment to evil. So they do not regret their evil. But they are angry with God for having sent them there. So it's a place of cursing God. in addition to all of the other problems of hell. But that's the, that's the society of hell. So, you know, you see these people on, on newscasts where they are cursing out people where they can't get through three words without the F word. Did you ever see that? <laughs> you know, that's what it's like. It's the kind of, but all of that would be directed toward God. For eternity, that's all you hear the whole day. No sleeping. People disgusted with God. It's not a pretty place. Even if there were no pain of sense, that would be hell enough. And naturally there horribly unhappy realizing that they, they will never ever be happy there's no uh, earthly thing or uh, created thing to console them nothing they just have that horrible pain of loss that they have frustrated their whole purpose of existence and there's no way out The just of the Old Testament had to await the beatific vision. But their time of waiting was different. The human race as a whole was being punished. And it was not yet the time of regeneration. But now that the redemption has taken place, the deprivation is much worse. See that the possibility of seeing God and possessing God is open to us. The deprivation is much worse. Tradition and theological reasoning teach that the suffering in purgatory is worse than all the suffering on earth. And it means this, for one and the same sin, the smallest suffering in purgatory is greater than any corresponding suffering on earth. Now, we don't know a lot about purgatory, but this is what theologians teach. It does not mean that the least pain in purgatory surpasses the greatest pain on earth. It does not mean that. It's just that you're going to suffer more in purgatory for a sin committed there than you would suffer for it here. That's what it means.
So the pain of loss of the beatific vision is caused, as I said, by the fact that the soul is no longer attached to the body and is no longer distracted by tangible goods. It no longer has that consolation of stuff, food, possessions, people, fun, all the things that we enjoy from day to day. It's gone. And second, because these souls in purgatory love God and their desire to see him therefore is very intense and they mourn over the obstacles they have placed in the way of enjoying him. So they, they have a deep remorse and regret over the attachments that they had in this life and their failure to remove those attachments, their complacency with venial sins in this world. So there, there is a, a gnawing of conscience and, and a remorse of conscience that is, is, is a, a very hard thing to bear. What they traded for. So the pain of loss of the beatific vision is caused, first of all, by the fact that the soul is no longer attached to the body. We're still talking about purgatory. And uh, is no longer distracted by tangible goods, which I explained already. And secondly, because these souls love God and their desire to see him is very intense. So that causes a greater sense of loss and they mourn over the obstacles they have placed in the way of enjoying him. So they have this terrible remorse over uh, what they have done to, or have failed to do, which has placed them in purgatory. Purgatory most probably has a fire which affects the soul. So again, we don't know a lot about purgatory. It's a speculation. The souls in purgatory bear their pains willingly. Our Lord spoke of the fires of hell, but he never spoke about the fires of purgatory. He never mentioned purgatory. But they bear their pains willingly. See, so purgatory and hell are, in that sense, two very different places. They come together in the pain of loss and a pain of sense. But the, the differences are this, is that the souls in purgatory are certain of their eternal salvation, uh, unless you accept what St. John of the Cross says. Uh, but they are in the state of sanctifying grace. They have supernatural charity. They love God. All right, so it's a society of people who love God intensely. that differs night and day from hell. And they, ha they do penance for their sins, they, they lament their sins, whereas people in hell have no repentance for their sins. They just blame God for putting them there, that's all. So that, that's a, a big, big difference between purgatory and hell. And also there's the, the uh, purgatory is only for a time. Whereas the despair of hell is that it just goes on forever. There's just no end in sight ever. So there's no despair in purgatory. Whereas there, there is despair in hell. So the soul sees how the pain is deserved in justice and offers it willingly, offers willingly its what we call its satisfaction. It's a, uh, it's a takeoff from the word satisfaction because here you can do satisfaction. You can do meritorious satisfaction. 
the only thing you can do in purgatory is satisfaction. That is, you can only pay the debt. There's no merit. There, there is no increase of grace. Your, your, your state is fixed for eternity as far as the state of grace and the level of grace and the intensity of grace. The souls in purgatory are not tormented by demons because they have achieved victory over the devil. They are in the state of grace. No one knows where purgatory is. St. Paul says that hell is in the center of the earth. It's a little known passage of St. Paul, but he says hell is in the center of the earth. Which would make sense because it's people that love the earth. And so they go to hell. Uh... The pains of purgatory diminish as the remains of sin diminish. So it gets lighter and lighter as time goes on. Most probably the pains of purgatory endure for a long time, especially in the case of deathbed conversions. So people who convert late in life, who have just an enormous amount of temporal punishment due to sin, and who, whose conversion is based probably on imperfect contrition and then the absolution of the priest. So they, they just get in. See. Those people have a, a heavy, heavy debt to pay. But nonetheless, they're there. Private revelations mention three or four centuries. But, you know, that's private revelations. So. <clears throat> so. St. Augustine had a metaphor concerning venial sin. He said, meditation on God is gold. Love of neighbor is silver. Good works are precious stones. But venial sins are wood, hay, and stubble. That's St. Augustine's metaphor. St. Thomas comments that wood, hay, and stubble are things which can be stored in a house, yet burned without burning down the whole house. So you put wood in a fireplace and it burns, but you don't burn down the whole house. So it is with venial sin, because you remain in the state of sanctifying grace even with venial sin. So the whole house is not burned down. Venial sins, therefore, are able to be removed in a soul either by temporal trials in this life, crosses, or by the fires of purgatory. Like wood, hay, and stubble, venial sins are more or less easily burned depending upon their seriousness. So there's all sorts of levels of seriousness in venial sins. Just like in mortal sins. Moreover, certain venial sins adhere more intensely to the soul than others, depending upon our affection for them. So again, that attachment to things, see, what kind of, uh, how complacent we are with our vices of venial sin. That's why it's important to constantly hate 
any kind of vice of venial sin in your daily examination of conscience. Renew that hatred for sin all the time. You're going to fall because only our Blessed Lady would not fall. You will fall, <clears throat> but you should fall only by sins of what we call weakness, which are usually not totally deliberate. Everybody does. Great saints do. No one's exempt except our Blessed Lady. <laughs> All right, so you should have a certain patience with yourself in that sense. But nonetheless, a constant hatred of those sins, a hatred of those vices. It's very important. Accordingly, some are punished in purgatory longer than others to the extent that some are more attached to their habits of venial sin than others. So you have the advantage, you know, in the priesthood, in the seminary and priesthood, of learning these things that lay people will never ever learn and will never interiorize. They might hear them once, but it goes. That's why, you know, the religious life is, 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 is the the paved expressway to heaven. So whereas it's much more difficult in the lay state. You just don't hear these things. You don't even know these things. You just go from day to day. So you should thank God for the grace of being in the seminary and hopefully pursuing the priesthood. It's not given to everyone. Since severity of punishment properly pertains to the seriousness of the fault and the length of punishment properly pertains to the removal of the punishment, so there is in purgatory a diversity of intensity of punishment and a diversity of length. So some suffer more intensely, some suffer longer. Some may be punished more severely, but for a lesser time, and others less severely, but for a longer time, depending on the, on the removal of the fault. Nothing can enter heaven that is stained with any kind of sin. All right? Any kind of vice, pride, gluttony, any of the capital sins, anything at all, attachments, it's all got to go. So if you're very attached to something in this life, right, that might take a long time to purify. Or if you're attached to something particularly bad, that might take an intense pain to purify. But there's nothing going to heaven. There's no pride in heaven. There's no lust in heaven. There's no, no venial sin in heaven. Nothing can enter those gates that is in any way even slightly tainted. St. Thomas says that the least punishment of purgatory is worse than the greatest punishment of this life, but I already explained what that means yesterday. And he says this, for as anything is the more desired, then the absence, absence of it is more painfully felt. But our affections for God in the next life will be much more intense than they are here. And moreover, we will know that the time is at hand for us to now see God and enjoy him. We will thus be all the more saddened by this deprivation. 
it's something we don't realize too much because our we're, we're living in a in a world where first of all we don't see God and and not that we'll ever see him in, in that sense but I mean it's he's invisible and we are surrounded by visible things that please us so our the intensity of our love of God is low but you see it in the great saints you see a, a very very strong intensity of love of God in the great saints and you see that 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 intensity must increase in the soul in purgatory you can't go to heaven without that intensity of a saint And the pain of sense will be greater since the body will not feel the fire but the soul. You see, the, the origin of feeling is your soul. It's not your body. When you die, you could stab somebody and he's not going to feel it. Because the soul is gone. The soul is the source of feeling. It's the principle of feeling. So both the fires of hell and the fires of purgatory or whatever there is of sense uh, suffering and purgatory will affect the soul itself. That is something like the dentist hitting your nerve when he drills your teeth. The, the nerve is the center of feeling. So you, you know, when you feel your hand or something like that, you're, you're remotely touching nerves. If you hit that nerve, Oh, does that hurt? See, but what is beyond the nerve is the soul. So think of pain like that. Where you hit the very principle of feeling. So just as we feel more pain as we come closer to a nerve, so will the soul feel the most pain when it is afflicted directly by the fires of purgatory. And don't forget what our Lord said about the fires of hell, that they, are, they were prepared for the devil and uh, his, uh, his followers, I forget the... But St. Thomas says that it's a special fire that affects the soul. It's not the fire that we ordinarily... See here, it, it's a special fire prepared for the devil who's immaterial, a special fire that, that uh, affects the souls, affects um, an immaterial thing. And it's, it's somewhat mysterious what he means by that, but that's the principle is that there is something at least analogous to fire, material fire, that affects the, the soul which is the principle of sensitivity. But that there's a fire of hell is de fide, because our Lord mentioned it. It is commonly held that it is the same fire which punishes the damned, which also purifies the souls in purgatory. It's commonly held. Again, most of purgatory is theological conclusion. Most of it. St. Gregory says that just as under the same fire, gold shines and chaff smokes. Chaff is what is left over from wheat after you grind it. It smokes. So under the same fire, the sinner is burned and the elect are purified. So the same fire of hell and purgatory. The elect are purified the chaff, that means those who are thrown out and those who are in hell, just burnt. Now, what are typical venial sins? Using bad language. 
that's ordinarily venial. Outbursts of impatience and anger. Vanity. Typical, almost always venial. Laziness in duties of state and life, particularly in prayer, spiritual laziness. but also other lazinesses where you can't be bothered or take a nap. <laughs> well, it's not wrong to take a nap if you need it, but in other words, you always, when it, with the use of time, you always have to say, what, what should I be doing now? What is the reasonable thing for me to be doing right now? Time is precious. Every minute is precious, and it should be used for the glory of God. So... Part of the glory of God is that you get adequate sleep. Part of the glory of God is that if you're falling asleep, you know, reading your theology, maybe you should take a nap for a while. That, that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, the Italians, you know, that's like the, the siesta, you know. I mean, you, you could never get them to abandon that. They would say that's like a sin to not take the siesta. And, and so, but there's a, there's a lot to say for that, that midday siesta. There's a lot to say for it because it really sets you up for the rest of the day. Whereas otherwise, by 5 p.m., you tend to, to go downhill. I don't know if you know that. That's the worst time of the day. 5 p.m., you start to decline in your energy and enthusiasm, etc. But if you take a siesta, actually, it, it makes it, you can go till 11 o'clock. See, so I'm not saying that, you know. But it, if you're... <laughs> You know, if you're uh, uh, doing too much siesta, you know, <laughs> then you've got some venial sin, you know. In, in Italy, it's something unheard of in this country, just unheard of. They actually shoo people out of the store for siesta time, even though a sale is going on. In America, if you have a sale going, you would stay there for another two hours while the sale is going down. You would skip lunch. You would do anything you had to do in order to get the sale. But even if you're about to buy something, you've got to you know, get out. They're going to lock the door because it's siesta time. It's so funny. It's a different, it's totally different mentality. I mean, losing a sale in America, you know, is, is from, the, from the commercial point of view, just like a mortal sin. You know, it's, it's just, oh, my goodness, how could you do that? You know, so anyway. Uh, but it's just very different mentalities. Um, so we'll, we'll, well, I can finish this now. We'll just take a few more minutes. Uh, lack of charity towards our neighbor, and especially through gossip and backbiting. And you have to watch that in religious communities, talking about everybody else. Right. Lies, what we call white lies. Exaggerations, which are a form of lying. You should have seen the fish I caught the other day. The size of a whale. <laughs> it has some truth in it. You caught a fish. You see, it's not a total lie. But it's a stretching of the truth, so you have an amplification of the truth. Acts of avarice and concupiscence of the eyes. See, so, oh, look at this, you know, and, oh, buying stuff, you know, and stuff that you don't need. So, again, whenever you go to buy something, you know, do I need it or do I want it? And you have to examine yourself whether this is a, a proper thing to do. Or if it's just some sort of indulgence of your concupiscence of the eyes. Sinful curiosity about impure things. It's a venial sin. Watching body or suggestive movies on television or other media. When I say body or suggestive, that doesn't mean what we call hard pornography. But Things that are very suggestive, that would be watching those, be venial sin. 
voluntary distraction in prayer. In order for distraction to be a sin, it has to be voluntary. That means you don't do anything about it. You know it's there, and you don't do anything about it. Little acts of stealing, taking a pencil, failure to profess the faith through embarrassment, being late for Mass, little acts of selfishness and pride, Right, so those are things that provide purgatory for you if they are if you do not repent of them there's many ways to, if you uh, again if you approach holy communion fervently and with penance as a spirit of penance authors say that remits all venial sin you know, that's theologians 